Well, here we are at Ictus Rufford. This is a brand new fishery in France, and in about a week's time, it opens its doors to the public. And uh, luckily enough, we've been granted permission to have a little go before those doors open. I get plenty of questions from you guys out there about going to France for the first time, fishing new waters, and how to approach it. Over the next few days, I hope to show you a lot about that. I don't know much about this place at all, so it's all brand new for me. I'm gonna to have to go out there, find my spots, work out where the fish are going to be passing through, what they're going to be feeding on, and how much they're going to be feeding on. Only yesterday this lake was frozen, so it's not going to be easy, but they're out there. So all we can do is give it my best shot, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I started fishing abroad obviously over 30 years ago now, but in those early years, it was mainly the wilder sort of public lakes that I was fishing. It wasn't until 2004 that I actually fished a, a real commercial water for the first time, which was Lac Serriere. It was certainly a different experience to the other French fishing I'd done or the other European fishing I'd done. There is a certain appeal to them for sure. You know, you've got the comforts, you've got the facilities, uh, and, and they are more English style. They're set up by English anglers a lot of time with the aim of giving anglers a holiday and the chance of catching. When deciding on your first trip across the channel, generally people come to France for their first trip, and that's understandable. There's such a huge variety of fisheries over here. Normally the first thing that I say to people is, what sort of fishing do you actually want to do? Because as much as there's a variety of fisheries, there's a variety of anglers too. Some want to come with their families and wives and they want all the facilities laid on. But there's, there's a lot of guys that say, no, I want the wild style of fishing. You know, That's what I want, to, the wild lakes where I'm not going to see a lot of other people. And, and there's something over here for everyone. Find somewhere that's right for you because there's thousands of lakes over here, literally. And you know, when you come in for the first time, you want it to be right. You want to come for the right reasons. So it could be coming for lots of action. It could be for that one big fish that's, you know, going to be a PB. Or it could be for that nice family holiday. And, and it's all here. It's all here. You've just got to find it. Well, we're just below Limoges, quite near to the town of Breve, actually. And we're at Ictus Rufford. It's about 60 acres in size, almost a little bit like a mini Cassian, the way it's laid out. It's got a main central body of water, which we're in now. The rest of it goes off into arms and it splits up into different areas. And so it's a really interesting lake in that, in that respect. I first met Jeremy from his original Ictus Lake, which is, is further down south near the Pyrenees, and immediately struck me that this was a guy who does everything properly. You know, he doesn't leave anything to chance. He, he does it right from start to finish. So he looked at the lake like a blank canvas. There, there were some original fish in, in here and they're those lovely dark wild strain of French carp but there's a lot of fish have obviously been added since Jeremy bought the lake and in total about 500 have gone in and they range from 20 pound up to over 60 pound. There's a lot of backup 40s and 50s and there's a, there's a lovely variety of fish. And so, you know, when the alarm sounds, you don't know what's going to be on the end, which is, you know, that's always nice. The facilities here are actually really good. I know it's got a wild feel about the lake. There's a lot here for the anglers and the people in general. There's a fantastic restaurant just up from where we're sitting. And uh, they do some beautiful meals in there. You know, you've got the, the chalets at the back here. Families can stop in those chalets and they've tried to make it a very people friendly place and you know that's exactly what they've done really boats are all supplied so everyone who comes here doesn't have to bring a boat and besides that the motors the echo sounders and everything to go with that can be hired here on site there is a great tackle shop here that supplies everything as well even looking at some of the swims you know some of the swims here are suitable for bivvies which is what I've done here, you know, set the bivvy up the Titan. But other swims have, have got big safari tents in them. There's various ways of actually getting onto here, uh, various booking agents. Most of my bookings are, are done through Armfield Angling. At the moment, it's just beginning, so quite a few 
people have already booked on, but there is spaces. But yeah, there's something here for everyone, I think. I think that's the story of this lake. It's, it's something for everyone. A number of waters I've fished down the years now are on the basis that you book a swim in advance and, and that is your swim for the week. It's no good going all guns blazing right from the start, filling it in with bait and then regretting it a couple of days later when you find out the fish aren't feeding as heavy as you thought they might. Uh, you know, it's the old story, you can put more in, you can't take it out. I would always start off a little bit steady, even if I think it is going to fish well, I'd start off a little bit steady and just see how the bites come. If you get a couple of bites, two or three bites the first night and day, yeah, you start putting a bit more in. Or just fish for a bite at a time. I've had loads of good sessions in the past where it's literally just fish for one bite at a time. And the fish will tell you if you're doing it right. You've very much got to be conscious that you're there for the duration of a week. It's not all about the first couple of days. You know, you've got to gradually stagger it so that you get the best out of it, really. And the best way is to start off a little bit steady and just gauge what's happening. Gauge what's happening and then you can adjust two or three days in. My initial thinking on bait is to go in with the instant action just to try and nick a quick bite. You know, it does what it says on the bag. It does get action quite instantly and I've used it to good effect a few times. I'm gonna start off with a strawberry crush, not put too much of it out, and then hopefully if that works, as the week goes on, start introducing a bit more of uh, the food source bait, if you like, in the shape of the Scopex squid. You know, the Scopex is a better food source bait, so that's what I'm banking my hopes on, that the fish are coming in, you know, and, and realise that. Now, the other thing I will be putting in for the whole week is some pellet. There's two reasons for that. One, I use it wherever I go and it works. The other thing is, these fish in here have come from a fish farm and they've been fed on pellet all their life, so they should recognise that as soon as it goes in. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, but there's a little bit of thought gone into the baking process and uh, hopefully it'll do the job. Well, I've got four rods out for the first night, so it was a little bit breezy out there, so it wasn't as easy as I was hoping it would be, but they're out, that's the main thing. I haven't gone too mad for the first night, I've just gone in with a little bit of bait to hopefully get me a bite. And that's mainly because I'm not sure exactly if I'm going to keep to these spots or not. There hasn't been much advice to go on. It's all brand new here. And the only thing to pick up on was that the bailiff here, Danny, was that he fished a couple of nights over Christmas actually in this swim. And the fish that he caught were from that far margin. Now it doesn't mean it's going to be the same this time, but I've got three rods on that far side. What I've done, it, it drops down lovely off that far margin to 11 foot and then flattens out. So I've dropped one there, and my third rod along, I've also dropped on that same shelf, which seems to run along most of it. Uh, but in the middle of this section across here, the middle rod across there, it shelves up a lot more shallow. So I've just gone up the shelf a little bit more. It hasn't got that ledge, it's just a, a shelf. So I'll put it in eight foot, just to vary the depth a bit and try something a little bit different. And this left-hand one, I've actually got on this side of the lake mainly because I was told that when the guys feed the fish here, which they have been over the winter, they start from the jetty down to my left ear. So if they're putting food in there, it stands to reason the fish are going to come in and eat it. Whether it's going to work or not, I don't know. It's all sort of uh, trial and error, I suppose, at the moment. So hopefully one or two of these rods are going to go off and I'm going to have a little clue as to uh, what to do, you know, for the coming days. If not, I might have to try something different tomorrow but that's why I haven't got in too heavy with the bait. You know, if it works all well and good, I can put more in in the coming days. Um, but tomorrow I might have to move them all different spots. So, you know, I'm baiting light for that reason. And for the fact that it's quite cold, the lake was frozen yesterday. They're not gonna wanna eat a lot at the moment, I don't think. So going on a bit of advice, what the bait is giving me, but also using my knowledge from the past on, on different waters. You know, it's important to listen to people, but also keep it in mind to go with your own instincts as well. You know, use a bit of both. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Trial and error. Hopefully something's gonna work and we'll find a clue from that.
Well, it was a proper blowy old night. Windy and wet, but we're off the mark. We got a fish, that's the main thing. And, uh, you know, I baited up lightly and with the instant action on the hope of nicking a quick bite, and that's exactly what it's done for us. It's got us a fish, so really pleased about that. Uh, the other thing, I suppose, was that it was at the bottom of the 11 foot shelf, that first rod I put out, um, and that was on the advice of the bailiff, so, you know, that was good advice. So there we go, it does pay to listen to people. So we've got one rod on a spot that I know works now, so there we go. Hopefully get more spots sorted out and more fish to come like this. I'll get him back now and uh, time for a nice cup of tea and a warm up, I think. Well, I suppose the beauty of actually fishing one swim is that you know you're not going to be moving anywhere. So, uh, yeah, in, in my case, I, I tend to take more than what I normally would, everything but the kitchen sink. You know, why not have it as comfortable as possible? You know, even if it's down to something like a bigger table to spread everything out on. You know, or more comfortable chairs, like the moon chairs. You know, they're, they're not the smallest of chairs, but they are the most comfortable. So. If I can fit them in, yeah, I will do. And most commercial fisheries tend to have bigger areas for setting up now. You know, they're not like the little English style ones where you can just squeeze a brolly in. Fishing abroad tends to be a social thing a lot of the time as well. You get two or three mates fishing together. So based on that, you know, certainly if there's room, I'll, I'll, I'll have the gazebo there because not only when it's red hot during the day or you know you might have days of rain, but it's, it's the social meeting place. You, you can all get in there and cook breakfast in the morning and have a chat in the evening. Things like the T3, as soon as the Titan T3 come out, I'll grab one of them straight away. Not only because it's easy to set up and put down the size of it, you spend a, a fair bit of time in the bivvy. So for me, it's important to have a lot of space, as much space as possible. But it's also that inner capsule that seals completely. Um, not only has it got mesh doors to keep all the mozzies out and things like that, but sewn in ground sheet. And the beauty of it is that it zips up fully and you know you can enclose yourself in, in that. Nothing from the outside gets in. So it makes life so much easier having that space and, and just doing your general chores. You know, things like having a wash and brush up, changing your clothes doing the washing up after dinner, you know, the cooking itself. These little comforts and things that make your life a little bit better for the week. You know, if you're comfortable, you fish better. What can't you have enough of? Well, custard creams, obviously. <laughs> There's always gonna be things that you really can't have enough of. We all dream about those trips where everything goes right, you know, you've got all the fish in your swim and you get in action all day, all night. That's what we all dream of and every now and then it is going to happen. People are going to have them trips. So the last thing you want is to be halfway through that trip and you run out of stuff. Those the obvious ones are things like hooks and leads. You know, we've all got our favourite patterns of hooks and if you run out and got to use, borrow some off your mate and they're not what you like, it's it's not quite the same using them, is it? Uh, and things like leads, you know, um, I tend not to use drop-off systems so much these days, but a lot of people do, still do. And, um, you know, if you're halfway through the week, three quarters of the way through and you run out of leads, might not be a shop nearby, your mates might want to keep hold of all theirs, so take them with you, make sure you've got enough. Certainly the other thing that you want to have with you is plenty of clothing, whether it's uh, just extra pairs of socks and things like that, and extra pair of trainers. You know, you might end up in the lake for whatever reason, trying to net a fish quickly. Uh, waterproofs for sure, because you never know when they're gonna come in. They, they get used a lot more than what you might think. You never know what you're gonna be faced with wherever you go in the world. First time I took Joan to France, I remember this little cloud coming across, and she said, oh, it's gonna be a little shower in a minute. It might not last long. Well, that, that shower lasted three days. Don't be fooled that going in a hot country, you know, in summertime is going to be hot all the time. You know, some of them can be cold in the evening. So, you know, make sure you've got jumpers and things like that. You know, just, just take it, make sure you've got it because you, it ain't easy to go and get more when you're out there.
Yeah, one of the questions I do get asked actually is about when people are coming abroad, should they step up their sort of rigs and end tackle and hook size and things like that? Uh, and the answer in most cases is no really. The, the fishing is surprisingly similar to, to back in the UK really. So what I've sort of done is, is come down to one rig that virtually suits all occasions. Um, and it is quite simple, it's quite straightforward and basic, but there's, there's also actually a lot of thought gone into it over the time. Every bit of the rig has got some sort of thought process behind it. It's all designed to do a job, but at the same time, I need something that if I need to change it after a fish or in the middle of the night, I can do it in about a minute. So it is quite straightforward, but it goes everywhere with me. It is my go anywhere rig. So from the Mia to Morocco, it's what I use. So, uh, well, let's take a little look through how I tie it up. Start off with a length of uh, skin link, which is coated braid. Now, I normally tie all of these up with a fairly long length. Basically, I might end up with it short for fishing over gravel or a little bit longer fishing over silt. So, you know, start off with something like that. The hook is a size six claw. That's my normal sort of go-to size. And I attach it basically KD style. Go through the eye from front to back, four turns, push the hair out, another four turns, and then back through the eye from back to front. So now the only bit of the, the braid I actually strip is the hair itself, the rest I leave intact, and then tie the loop afterwards for the bait, whatever bait I'm using. In this case, I've got a snowman, so it's a little bit longer. For a single bottom bait, just make it shorter. And then the last little finishing touch is a little bit of silicon tubing. I don't even use uh, shrink tubing for this. It's about a half inch, but literally all that does is slide down over the eye, and it acts as a little bit of a kicker, and it's also quite soft in the, in the fish's mouth. Um, and that really is it. You know, I said it was basic, and it's easy to tie up, and it really is, but, you know, that rig goes everywhere with me. Well, a, a boat opens up a whole new world of possibilities. You know, that's, that's got to be said from the start. And I, I've known people go abroad and they've had the use of a boat and not used it because either they're not used to it, they're a little bit worried about it. All I can say is that you can fish a lot more effectively with a boat and every single time I can use one, I do. But of course, you, you've got to be very careful with it. You know, being out in the water is dangerous enough. You know, it's getting to know your capabilities. Everything takes practice. So if you've never used one before, don't go straight out 300 yards out in the lake. You know, have, have a little practice for a day. It, it, it's not much time out your trip, but it gets you used to to doing it. Most boats seem to come with electric engines now where you can hire them, um, but never leave the oars out of the boat because there's always a time when them batteries run out or as has happened to me a couple of times, you know, you go through another line and you're stuck there. The engine's clogged up, you need those oars. So always leave the oars in the boat. One of the spots has worked down the far end of the swim, uh, but the other rods up towards this area uh, produce nothing so far. I'm sure there's fish around this area, so it is just a matter of finding the right spot, basically. I'm just gonna keep trying and, until, basically, uh, I pick up a bit of action. Once I'm pretty close to where I think I wanna be, uh, I, I forget the motor, I switch the motor off and just use the oars because you can manoeuvre so much easier and turn in tighter circles with the oars and what you can with the, the motor. So it's much easier just to get it spot on. I mean, it's a lovely day for doing it today. The wind's dropped and uh, it's not raining as well. So it's, it's good conditions for, for getting the rod out. Okay, I think this looks like about the spot. It's about eight and a half foot here. I know it's a nice flat sandy hard bottom. So uh, we'll give it a go anyway. When I drop the rig, I'll just give it a little swing back just to straighten that hook length out. And then a couple of little donks when it's actually rock hard. Just a nice sandy bottom there. Beautiful for presenting the bait, really. 
I think the depth's the most important thing at the moment. So I, I think they need to be in around between sort of seven and 10, 11 foot, something like that. So same as before, just enough to get one bite, a few little scoops of uh, particle and crush boily and a bit of pellet. And just a few whole boilies, not loads. You know, this may well get me a bite tonight, but it might not, so I might be moving it again tomorrow. But there's enough there that if anything does come along, it should smell that and uh, hopefully I want to eat it. There we go, that's them all done. Now you might notice I've got my rod tips right up in the air. And it's something that people ask me about a lot, actually. Why do I have them up in the air like that? Well, everything is done for a reason. It's not just because I think they look good or anything. But basically, four rods on a pod, lines spread out around the swim. For instance, if that rod goes off and a fish gets snagged, I need to get out there as quick as possible. And, of course, the boat's this side. So uh, I could try and get across the lines, but I've done that in the past and uh, ended up in all sorts of bother and tangled lines so it's it's so much easier just to actually pull the boat underneath the rods and yeah I mean you can say about having lines high in the water I don't think it makes that much difference well put it this way it actually solves more problems than what it causes so that's why I do it you don't want things too cluttered in the boat you know things like bait all I carry bait wise in my boat is a little bucket just enough to bait a couple of rods up. And one really good little bit of advice, what I always do, is carry a little box of spares in the boat. And, and all you've got in there is say a couple of leads, uh, a couple of rigs made up, a few hook baits, and a pair of scissors as well. Because you, you never know, I actually end up using that a lot more than what you think you might do. You know, you go out there, you go to drop a bait, and the lead drops off. Well, instead of coming all the way back to the bivvy, or even sometimes, you know, I tend to feel around with the lead for spots. Donk, you hit a snag or something like that and you end up pulling for a break. Well, if you've got a spare rig in the boat with you, just do it, redrop it. Saves all that effort of having to come back. So yeah, I mean, little things like that. It's, you don't need lots. Keep it tidy in there, but have a few essentials with you. My first choice and my advice to people really would always be to go with boilies. For me, they always catch the biggest fish anyway. But of course, there is always the cost implications and people say to me, you know, it's, yeah, I want to use boilies, but it's the price, I, I, I haven't got that sort of money. Well, there are ways around it. You know, I mean, take the instant action range of baits. They're, they're brilliant baits. I've used them in countries all around the world and they've always worked for me. And they, they don't have to be expensive. You know, Nash do a, buy two get one free deal and if you buy in bulk you know it works out less than five quid a kilo you know that to me is good bait at a reasonable price and like I say you know it catches fish everywhere for me besides the main boily approach it, it's always worth having a variety of stuff with you because you never know what's going to work on the day and other things just add to the mix whether it's maggots hemp I like to use pellets you know it's always worth having something like that a bit of variety with you one of the questions I do get asked is, you know, about keeping boilies certainly over a, a long session, a long period of time. And it was always a problem in the past with freezer baits if there's not freezers on site. And, you know, what I get asked is, would I be happy using stabilised baits? And, well, the answer these days is, is yes. You know, stabilised baits have, have moved on in leaps and bounds. And, you know, the, the Nash ones now, they use a, a human grade preservative. And th there's really not much difference between the freezer baits and the stabilised. So, you know, the difference is though that after a week or two weeks, those stabilised baits um, are still as good as the day you took them out there. So yeah, I'm quite happy using those. Well, we're a couple of days in now, just going into the third evening actually, and it's been a lovely day, but so far just the one fish. 
Well, there could be a number of reasons for that. You know, it might be that we're not on the fish. Uh, it could be the fish are here and just not switched on yet. It does seem like the cold weather from a few days ago has sort of thrown the spanner in the works and um, it's taken a little while for the fish to switch on. I know the guy who used to run the trips down to Rainbow Lake, he used to have a say in like the midweek crisis because there'd be so many people if it hadn't happened by Tuesday or Wednesday, they'd start panicking and, you know, what do I do now? Or do I change everything? Well, a session is from the day you arrive until the day you finish. And there's no saying that the fish are gonna come at the start. They could all come at the finish. So the important thing is not to panic. Just keep your confidence up. You know, a session isn't over until that gear's in the van and you're driving home. And it can happen from in the first hour, it can happen in the last hour. Stick with it. Well, there we are, another nice ruffled mirror. Not a monster, but very pleased to see it. And again, it come from that marginal shelf, which is sort of over behind me here. Mwah. Off we go, sunshine. Lovely stuff. That water's cold. <laughs> and it's all up my arms. <laughs> There's a couple of problems that you might come across on continental waters, basically crayfish and little catfish in the shape of poisson chats. And what they do is nibble away at your baits, basically. You know, I do try and use bait straight out of the bag most times. If that's not feasible, then one of these could do the job. These are hard-ons, and they're basically the same version of bait, but just much harder. So they're gonna stay out there a lot longer. Now, if it's really bad, you know, I might use tiger nuts or even plastic baits, but really I do prefer to use something that is as similar to the bait I'm putting out as possible. So, you know, if I'm putting out scopet squid, Scopet squid hard-ons are the perfect answer. Times of year to go, you know, I mean, for me, my favourite times would sort of generally be April, May, September, October. But there's other things to factor in, you know, the family might want to go when it's at its hottest in August. Um, but also, you know, it might be the case you want a winter break when the weather's horrible in England and it's snowed in and, you know, there's places out there that are actually warm and sunny. You know, Grand Canaria, Morocco, these are lovely sunny places throughout winter time. So, you know, whatever time, there is a time and a place for everyone there. Well, that is it, end of another trip. I mean, it's been okay, it's been tough the last couple of days, but um, you know, I've had a couple of fish, so I'm happy enough with that. I've got to get the rods in now, hit the road, so see you next time.